Remember, there are three, actually there are more elucities, but the three that we are focusing on this weekend are the recollections of the Buddha, and tomorrow, briefly, we'll take recollections of the Dhamma and the Sangha. So this is a discourse that the Buddha gave to his foremost female lay disciple. Her name was Visaka. And in this sutta, the Buddha is explaining different ways of observing the Uposita. The Uposita is the Indian religious observance day, observed by followers of all the different schools of religious commitments and schools of religious practice in India. And so the Buddha is, explains the Uposita first to Visaka by way of undertaking the eight precepts. These are start with the five precepts, except that the third precept is changed for this day and night from abstaining from sexual misconduct to observing complete sexual restraint. So it's not killing, not stealing, no sexual activity, no speaking falsehood, no use of intoxicants, then three f other precepts, which are based on the precepts of a monastic, a novice monastic. Not to eat after midday, not to enjoy, not to use um, personal ornamentation, or to enjoy different types of entertainment, singing, <laughs> dancing, music, shows, and then not to sleep on a high bed, but to sleep. Usually they will spread a mat on the ground and sleep on the ground, or on a low bed. And then he continues by explaining how, when one has undertaken the precepts of the Uposita, the eight precepts, how one cultivates the mind. And here he's explaining how to clean or to cleanse the defiled mind. And he says, the defiled mind is cleansed by exertion. So when one practices, even the recollection of the Buddha, one is making an exertion. It's not that one is just sitting there passively, expecting the Buddha to cleanse the mind. You know, it's not a passive submission to the Buddha, but one is bringing the qualities of the Buddha to, the, to mind as a way of cleansing the mind. And as we saw in the passage that I, we looked at last night, the Buddha is one who is completely free of greed, hatred, delusion, all defilements. And so when one brings the Buddha to mind, or the Dharma, or the Sangha, then there's no opportunity, or little opportunity, for the defilements to sneak, in, to sneak into the mind. And then when the mind becomes even partly cleansed through recollection of the Buddha, then, we saw last night, a kind of inspiration arises. The word that's used there is Veda, which is also the name of the Brahminical scriptures, the Vedas. So the word Veda, it actually comes from a root vid, which means to know. But the way it's explained in the commentary, it's a kind of knowledge accompanied by joy. So one is gaining knowledge of the qualities of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And with that knowledge, that knowledge, is a, that understanding, brings along a joy, it generates a joy. So here, in this sutta, the Buddha says that the noble disciple recollects the Tathagata, the Buddha, thus, the way we have been doing. The Blessed One is an Arahat, the Enlightened One, the Blessed One. Okay, so when the Noble Disciple recollects the Tathagata, his or her mind becomes tranquil. So there comes in that tranquility, I think this is Pasati, and joy arises. So that arising of joy is 
important step in the movement towards samadhi or concentration. So joy arises, and then as that joy sort of settles down, it becomes a feeling of inner feeling of happiness and contentment. And that feeling of happiness and contentment brings the mind to a unified focus on the qualities of the Buddha. And so in this way, he says, the defilements of the mind are abandoned in the same way that one's head, when dirty, is cleansed by exertion. So if one wants to clean one's head, and one doesn't just pour, put water on it, but one has to make an effort. And so then the Buddha says, how does one cleanse the dirty head by exertion? So I've actually modernized the text here. <laughs> because in those days they had other ways of cleansing. They didn't have the, the kind of shampoo that immediately <laughs> turns into a soap. Okay, so how does one cleanse the dirty head by exertion? By means of shampoo, water, and the appropriate effort. So it's in that way that the head, when dirty, is clean, cleansed by exertion. And so in this way, the defiled mind is cleansed by exertion. And then interesting, the Buddha says, this is called a noble disciple who observes the uposita of Brahma. Interesting expression rather than the uposita of Buddha. So I'm a little puzzled why. But, and who dwells together with Brahma. So Brahma was the supreme deity venerated by the Brahmins. And the Buddha becomes even a teacher of the Brahmins. But here it seems to be equating the Buddha with Brahma. And it is by considering Brahma that his mind becomes tranquil, joy arises, and the defilements of the mind are abandoned. Actually, they're not eradicated by this practice. That requires the development of insight or wisdom. But the defilements of the mind are temporarily abandoned. They're abandoned by a kind of, let's say, a process of substitution Someone is taking a very pure, beautiful, uplifting, wholesome object, the qualities of the Buddha, and focusing the mind on those qualities. And through that focusing, the defilements are sort of pushed out of the mind, and they go into a state of suspension. But it doesn't mean that at this point they are completely eliminated. Okay, then the Buddha continues that the defiled mind is cleansed by exertion. How is that done? Here the noble disciple recollects the Dhamma, and we're going to take that recollection tomorrow. And then in the same way, when one recollects the Dhamma, the mind becomes tranquil, joy arises, and the defilements are abandoned. In the same way that the body, when dirty, is cleansed by exertion. Interesting that in the case of the Buddha, it's the head that is cleaned. Maybe because the Buddha is at the head of the three jewels, or the three refuges. So the Buddha is, in a sense, the, the one who makes the Dhamma available. And it's through the Buddha's teaching of the Dhamma that people come into the Sangha and then become liberated through the teaching. And so the Dhamma is compared here to the body. So how does one cleanse a dirty body by exertion? Here by means of a brush, soap, again I've modernized this since they say using, I think, cow dung. <laughs> cow dung. <laughs> and the appropriate effort. So the important 
point which is included in each of these is the appropriate effort. That is the exertion. And so one has to make the effort to keep the mind on the qualities, whether the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. The mind will naturally drift away from the object. Thoughts will come into the mind. The mind will get distracted by those thoughts. So what does one do? One makes the effort to bring the mind back to those qualities. And if one is going through the long list of qualities, if the mind gets distracted and one loses track of one's reflection, what does one do? Exactly, right, exactly right. One goes back to the beginning. Unless one cheats. <laughs> but there's no reward. Like if you're going through nine Buddha qualities and then you forget where you are, <laughs> and then you think, I'm going to jump in at um, nowhere of the world, and that way I'll get to the last one, Bhagavad, before my neighbor. <laughs> yeah, there's no reward. It's not a competition to see who gets to the end first. So if you lose track, you just go back to the beginning and go through again. And that's actually a way of, you set yourself the task of going from the beginning to the end without losing track. And that sort of forces one to strengthen the concentration, concentrate, to strengthen the mindfulness. Okay, again, the Buddha comes to the theme of the defiled mind is cleansed by exertion, and how is that done? Here, the noble disciple recollects the Sangha thus. Then comes the formula for recollection of the Sangha. And again, the mind becomes tranquil, joy arises, the defilements are abandoned in the same way that a dirty cloth is cleansed by exertion. I don't quite know the way Sangha relates to cloth. But anyway, how is the cloth cleaned? By means of detergent. Again, I've modernized the original Indian text. Water and the appropriate effort. So that's how one cleans the dirty cloth. And so, we could say from this that by recollecting the qualities of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, using the appropriate effort, we're cleansing the mind, cleansing the mind of those harmful qualities that cause so much harm and suffering and misery and trouble for ourselves and for others that we interact with. So that is the Sutta to Visaka on recollection of, it actually brings in six recollections, but I've just taken the first three. Okay, here is a Sutta which speaks about, this is not just the recollection of the three jewels, but it is the, what's called unwavering confidence in the three jewels. So he says that there are these four streams of merit. So merit here is, the Pali word is punya, which means like wholesome states of mind, which bring beneficial results. So these are called four streams of merit, streams of the wholesome. So it's not just little, little creeks little babbling brooks of the wholesome. But these are streams of the wholesome. And they're called nutriments of happiness. The qualities that nourish the arising of happiness. And they're called heavenly ripening and happiness conducive to heaven. But of course, for Buddhism, heaven is just like the temporary goal. It's not the final goal. But for those who are not yet going to realize the final liberation in this life. Well, maybe some prefer to come back to the human realm, but the heavenly realms are supposed to be 
to have a greater amount of happiness. <laughs> and probably against the background of the Indian culture of that time, there was a strong aspiration for life in heaven. But these are going to be qualities that are possessed by a noble disciple who has reached at least the stage of stream enterer. So the stream enterer is one who has cut off the fetters, the, the lower fetters, and is, has a maximum of seven more existences, either in the human realm or in the heavenly realm. And so a disciple of this category is bound for liberation, bound to attain final nirvana. <laughs> and so it's not that they're choosing heaven rather than nibbana, but since they're going to continue in the round of existence seven more, at most seven more times, might as well take the heavenly rebirth <laughs> rather than the human rebirth. <laughs> Okay, and so the qualities are, this is called unwavering confidence in the Buddha. And the Pali word that's translated here, unwavering, is a somewhat difficult word to translate adequately. <coughs> the expression is, Right off. off. And then uh, okay. Off and press A. And then you see A. I see. Okay. Yeah. I have it on my left off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's called Avecha Pasada. And the word Avecha comes from the verb. which actually is comprised of ava plus eighty, whoops, eighty. So ava usually means, gives the indication of down or under, and eighty means to go or to come. So of eighty, it could be translated literally as under to undergo. And so this is to undergo the experience of realization. And a vecha is the, in grammar is called the absolutive, which has the sense in English of having done something. So it's, this is the confidence, pasada is confidence that comes from having undergone or having experienced the truth of the Dhamma. And so somebody who undergoes that experience of realizing the truth of the Dhamma then gains a confidence in the Buddha, his teaching, and the Aryan Sangha, the Noble Sangha. It's a confidence that can't be shaken, can't be um, that can never waver, that can never be lost, but is a kind of fixed, unwavering confidence. And there's a story that comes in the commentaries, a kind of humorous story to illustrate this kind of confidence. It said that in the Buddha's time, there was a lay disciple who went to listen to the Buddha give a Dhamma discourse. And while that disciple was listening to the discourse, the Buddha went through the three characteristics, impermanence, suffering, non-self, then the Four Noble Truths. And as the disciple was sitting there listening, he became a stream mentor. He made that breakthrough to the Dhamma. Then after the discourse, he went back home. And then Mara, you know, Mara is the evil one who doesn't like people to 
escape from his realm, from the realm of the world. So Mara thought, ah, that disciple has now gained strong confidence in the Buddha. He might be on the verge of escaping my grip. So let me go and sort of deflect him from his, from his trust and confidence in the Buddha. And so it said that Mara has this ability to transform himself into any shape that he wants, any form that he wants, including the form of the Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> so Mara transforms himself into the form of the Buddha then he goes to the home of this lay disciple <laughs> knocks on the door the lay disciple opens the door and thinks wonderful the master has come to me so he bows down to the Buddha, says, Venerable One, please come in, offers him a seat, maybe offers a cup of tea or something. <laughs> then Mara Buddha says to him, <laughs> You know, this afternoon you came to hear me give a discourse. Oh yes, a wonderful discourse, one day. Um, you remember I said that all conditioned things are impermanent? Yes, certainly, Pandit, certainly. Well, I've been reconsidering. <laughs> <laughs> and I've come to see, you know, that maybe not all conditioned things are impermanent. You know, some things are impermanent, but not everything. But now this lay disciple, because he had this confirmed confidence in the Buddha, so he had realized the truth for himself, he knew <laughs> the Buddha doesn't go back on his word. <laughs> so he said, you're not the Buddha. I know who you are. You are Mara. Mm -hmm. And so when Mara is called out, then he can't maintain his disguise any longer. So then he, when he's called out, then he disappears right on the spot. Okay, so that's a little story that illustrates confirmed confidence. Okay, so these are called this unwavering, unshakable confidence. Uh, confidence. I think I've been attending too many conferences. <laughs> <laughs> this unshakable confidence in the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. So those are three attributes of a noble disciple who has made the breakthrough. And they're called streams of merit. And the fourth is possessing the virtuous behavior that's dear or loved by the noble ones. That would be observing the five precepts unbroken, flawless, unblemished, and so forth. So those are the four streams of merit. Okay, then there's another sutta which speaks about four of the foremost kinds of confidence. Here, the confidence is not qualified by a vecha, by unshakable or unwavering. So even for those of us who have not yet reached that stage of unwavering confidence, but just to generate even our, even a small degree of confidence in the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, these are called the foremost kinds of confidence. So the text begins by saying, what up to whatever extent there are living beings, whether footless, or with two feet, four feet, many feet, the Tathagata, the Arahant, the Samasambuddha is declared the foremost among them. So the Buddha is, it seems a little bit like, how can the Buddha say that about himself? It seems <laughs> rather arrogant and self-promoting. But the Buddha 
has eradicated all traces of <coughs> arrogance, conceit, ego identity, and so he can declare that about himself. And he doesn't say, I am the foremost, but when he's speaking sort of impersonally about himself, then he refers to himself as the Tathagata. So he says, of all the living beings, the Tathagata is declared the foremost among them. Then those who have confidence in the Buddha have confidence in the foremost. And for those who have confidence in the foremost, the result is foremost. Because first, generating that confidence, that trust, that devotion towards the Buddha in itself generates a stream of merit which will be conducive to beneficial results even within the cycle of birth and death within samsara. And then that confidence becomes the motivation for entering the path of practice and continuing on the path of practice till one achieves the final goal. So that confidence then becomes the spur, the motivation for entering and continuing with the cultivation of the path. Okay, then the next, the Buddha says, to whatever extent there are things, dhammas, that are conditioned, the noble eightfold path declared the foremost among them. And then those who have confidence in the Eightfold Path have confidence in the foremost. And again, for them, the result is foremost. Okay, then he says, the next one, this is interesting, he says, to whatever extent there are dhammas, things, phenomena, conditioned or unconditioned. You see, of conditioned phenomena, things that put together through causes and conditioning factors, of those things, the foremost is the Noble Eightfold Path. But in the next, the Buddha extends the range of Dhammas to include the unconditioned, and the unconditioned is Nibbana. So the Noble Eightfold Path is what leads to Nibbana, but is conditioned, it's right view, right intention, right speech, and so on. So those are things we create or we bring into being through our determination, our effort. But Nibbana doesn't depend on conditions, it's always existing. So if all Dhammas, conditioned or unconditioned, Viraga, this passion, is the foremost, and that this passion is identified with the crushing of pride, the removal of thirst, the uprooting of attachment, the termination of the round, and so on, cessation, <coughs> nibbana. Okay, then, to whatever extent there are sanghas, or groups, the sangha of the Tathagata's disciples is declared the foremost among them. That is, the four pairs of persons, the eight types of individuals. I'll go through that very briefly tomorrow. So this Sangha of the... Well, actually, this is the formula that we recite for the Sangha. Worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of reverential salutation, the field of merit in the world. So those who have confidence in the Sangha have confidence in the foremost. And for those who have confidence in the foremost, the result is foremost. Okay, this is a sutta that comes in the Samyutta Nikaya, also in the Diga Nikaya, in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, where Ananda hears that as the Buddha is traveling on his teaching rounds, that people in different villages in which the Buddha has arrived, people who are known to be advanced disciples, lay disciples, they've heard that these disciples have passed away. And Ananda keeps on coming to the Buddha and saying, well, 
I've heard that this one has died, that one has died, this one has died, that one has died. What is their destiny? What has happened to them after death? And the Buddha starts off by saying that this disciple was a stream enterer, that one was a once returner, this one was a stream enterer, that one was a once returner, that one was a non-returner. Until it seems the Buddha, I can't say that he loses patience, <laughs> but he says, Ananda, it's not necessary to keep on coming to me all the time and asking about what has happened to this disciple, to that <laughs> disciple, but I'll teach you a mirror of the Dhamma such that a noble disciple can use this to look into his own, or his, her own mind and determine whether they are truly a stream enterer, one who is finished with rebirth in hell, finished with the animal realm, finished with the domain of the pretas, finished with the bad realms of rebirth, no longer bound to the lower world, fixed in destiny with some bodhi, with enlightenment as my destination. And that mirror of the Dhamma is looking into oneself to seeing whether one possesses unwavering confidence in the Buddha, in the Dhamma, in the Sangha. And whether one possesses those, the fourth, those virtues dear to the noble ones, unbroken, unblemished, and so on. But I have to say, this is not maybe an invincible or infallible key to knowing whether one is a stream enter or not. Because one could have very strong faith and devotion to the three jewels, and one could have very, very firm adherence to the five precepts, and maybe one has strong meditative experience, even of samadhi or insight, so that one thinks that one has reached realization, but it's just been another experience, a special experience, but not the actual breakthrough. So I don't really know how that can be an infallible guide. But the Buddha is not around, so I can't ask him that question. <laughs> Uh, so now turning away from that the confidence in the three jewels, I just wanted to bring in some of the texts because very often people say that, oh, the Pali suttas are very dry, repetitive, boring, and then... <laughs> okay, a little competition here, but <laughs> you open the Mahayana sutras and they're so abusive in their praise of the Buddha, you know, so eloquent, so grandiose. And so it seems to put us in a little corner of trying to defend our dry, repetitive Pali <laughs> Sutta. But if you sort of look closely, we find in the suttas that there are some suttas which really give very, very beautiful, eloquent expression to a deep devotion to the Buddha. So I've taken some examples. So this is from the Anguttara Nikaya. It's like, if you want the reference, it's the Book of Fours, number 23. So it praises the Buddha as one who is the vanquisher of all, the wise one who has untied all knots, the one who has reached the supreme peace, who has reached Nibbana, who is inaccessible to fear, the one whose taints, whose asavas are destroyed, whose doubts are all cut off, the one who has reached the destruction of all karma, who is liberated in the extinction of the acquisitions, the acquisitions of the things of bases of attachment. And he is called the lion unsurpassed, the one who in this world with its devas has set in motion, it's called the wheel of Brahma. This is the same as the Dhamma Chakra, the wheel of Dhamma. And then it speaks about how those devas and human beings 
who have gone for refuge to the Buddha, assemble and pay homage to him, the great one who is free from all diffidence, all hesitation, all fear. And it said, of the tame, he is the best, or tamed, he is the best of all tamers. This is like the Anuttaro Purisadama Sarati, the supreme trainer of persons to be tamed. Peaceful, he is the seer among the peace bringers. Freed, he is the chief of liberators. Crossed over, that's crossed over the flood of birth and death. He is the best of guides that leads across. And so then it continues, thus indeed they pay him homage, the great one free from diffidence. Diffidence, maybe it's an unusual word. Maybe. Let's see if we get some. Oh, my word gives us a list of synonyms. That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, diffidence is sort of timidity, <laughs> hesitation, fearfulness. So in this world, together with its devas, there is no one who can rival you. And then there's a passage that I've taken from, it's the very end of the Sutta Nipata. The last chapter of the Sutta, Sutta Nipata is called the Parayana, which means the way to the beyond. And in this particular collection, there is an old Brahmin named Ping. Pingya. Wait. So Pingya is. This is terrible. I don't know what's happening to my memory. <laughs> Yeah. Is that the one you want? Yeah, I have it. I took it down. Oh. Okay. You know, I translated this. It's not Pingya Bharadvaja, is it? Pingya Bharadvaja? No. <laughs> okay. So this old Brahmin Bhavari hears a report that there is one in the world who is a Buddha. But Bhavari is living, this might be now the state of Andhra Pradesh or Tailandia, quite far away from the northern regions where the Buddha is living. And he has 16 disciples who have studied with him the Vedas and mastered the Vedas and he wants to find out whether this is truly the Buddha and so he sends those disciples to the Buddha and the 16 disciples go to the Buddha and ask him very profound questions and the Buddha answers and they all then develop the faith in the Buddha and become monastic disciples of the Buddha and stay with the Buddha, except for one, the oldest of the 16, whose name is Pingya, and he is the one who returns to his master, Bhavari, to report the good news. And so then he reports to Bhavari the experience the, of their encounter with the Buddha, and now Bhavari is speaking to Pingya. And he says, why do you dwell apart from him, even for a moment, O Pingya, from Gotama of broad wisdom, from Gotama of broad intelligence, the one who taught you the Dhamma that's directly visible, immediate, the destruction of craving without adversity, for which there is no simile anywhere. 
And then Pingya answers and he says, I do not dwell apart from him even for a moment, O Brahman, from Gotama of broad wisdom, from Gotama of broad intelligence, the one who taught me the Dhamma. Then he continues, Heedful, O Brahman, night and day, I see him with my mind as if with my eyes. I pass the night paying homage to him. Hence, I do not think I am apart from him. And it's said in the commentary, if I remember, that all the other 15 disciples achieved arhatship, but Pinkia became only at the third level, a non-returner. So he says, <clears throat> my faith and rapture my mind and mindfulness do not depart from Gotama's teaching in whatever direction that one of broad wisdom goes, I pay homage to him in that same direction. Then he says, since I am old and feeble, my body does not travel there, but I go constantly on a journey of thought, for my mind, O Brahman, is united with him. And this is really like beautiful, like this is, this is early Buddhist bhakti, <laughs> devotional verses. Okay, so maybe that covers some of the themes that I wanted to cover about refuge, the sense of the three <laughs> refuges, the three jewels, the role of confidence. If there's any questions, we could maybe take any brief questions. Okay, if there are no questions, then... <laughs> Bhante, can you go up to the top so I can see where this came from again, please? Okay, so Thank this you. is... It's very beautiful. Yes, yeah, from the Sutta Nipata. Can we do a little advertisement? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you find it in this. <laughs> you have it. Okay, so it's verses. These are the verse, num the verse numbers. It's at the very. It's actually the very end of the Sutta Nipata. Okay. And then what happens? Actually, what happens after Pingya recites those verses? Then the Buddha sends. Apparently, the Buddha is sort of picking up on this mm. all the way from the north of India. And then the Buddha sends an image of himself into the presence of Babari and Pingbya. Mm. And then the Buddha, let's see what he says. He says, as Vakali sent forth faith, and Badra, Badra Buddha, and Alavi Gautama. Vakali, we know from a sutta in the um, Samyutta Nikaya, in the Kanda Samyutta. Badra Buddha was another one of those 16 disciples. And Alavi Gautama, nobody really has a reference for him. I think even the Dictionary of Pali, proper names, just says he's mentioned here, but there's no other account of him. But apparently they were disciples who were also of the Sadhanusari type, the type motivated by faith. So he says, just so you too must send forth faith, then, Pingya, you will go beyond the realm of death. So when Pingya hears this, then he says, I am pleased even more to hear the word of the Muni, of the sage, the enlightened one with the obstructions removed, is one who is not barren, gifted with 
I think it's satipana, it's ingenuity. Having directly known about the Vedas, he understood everything, high and low. The teacher, the Buddha, is the <coughs> end maker of questions for those who come to him in doubt. Then he says, the immovable, the unshakable, that is Nibbana, has no simile, no comparison anywhere. Surely I will go there. I have no doubt about this. So remember me as one with mind resolved, one with a determined mind. And then that's the end of the Sutta Nipata. Okay, then maybe we take the break now, and then we come back 6.30, we'll have